from the Holy Gospel of Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O God. Then Jesus called the crowd to himself and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you had said? He answered them, Every plant that my heavenly Father has planted will be uprooted. That has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are unknowing guides of the unknowing. And if one person who is unknowing guides the other, both will fall into the pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes in to the mouth enters into the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples called and urged him, saying, Send her away. For she keeps shouting after us. He answered them, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Let us open with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had what I call, for me I call it a puddle moment. A puddle moment because I remember when I was about 30 and I had graduated from seminary and I was convinced it was going to be a great year followed by a great decade and then the year of 30 was absolutely miserable. Nothing was working right. I couldn't find a call. I'd had relationships that had broken and I just was brokenhearted all over the place. And one day in the summertime I remember waking up and feeling like I was at the bottom of a pit, looking up, just trying to imagine that God was there. And I remember saying to God, I, I know that you're there, but I don't feel you right now. I know that you're there, but I just, I just can't hold on. And I remember my invisible hand reaching out and thinking, I'm hanging on by my fingernails, Lord. I wonder when they're going to break. I have very flimsy fingernails, by the way. But then I remember kind of feeling like maybe God had grabbed hold of me. 
maybe grabbed my wrist. And that when I couldn't grab God, maybe, maybe God was grabbing me. And as much as I visualized this and I kind of saw this happening, I was still so heavy hearted. And my whole self felt heavy, and so I did the one thing that I could possibly do. I was staying at my mom's house at the time, and I literally, I don't know if I figuratively or literally did this, but I think I literally crawled out of bed, down the stairs, into my mom's bedroom. You can do this even at 30, right? Into my mom's bedroom and crawled onto her bed and cried for about an hour as she just sat there. And I don't know if she put her hand on my back or if she just sat there, but she sat with me for an hour as she was trying to get ready for work. Um, And I just had my puddle moment where all I could do was cry. This woman, this woman from Canaan, this native woman from this land, she was in desperation. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe you feel that way now. Maybe you too are a parent who's worried about your child or an aunt or an uncle or a teacher who's worried about our kids, or a, or a child, an adult child, or a, a young child worried about your parents. And maybe you re- can resonate with this uh, Canaanite woman who is so worried about her daughter because her daughter is racked by demons. They call them demons or evil spirits in that day. Perhaps today, would we call it mental illness? Whatever it is, there's an anguish going on in her beloved child's whole body and mind, and it's just keeping this child from being able to even live. She's barely holding on. And so this mother is worried. She's worried and she's desperate and she hears about this itinerant Jewish preacher, this teacher, this healer, and he comes into this land of Tyre and Sidon that is filled with people who are Gentiles. And, And those who are Jewish in Jesus' day often set themselves apart from those who are Gentiles. It was part of their ritual purity. It was part of their identity. And yet, she somehow, she somehow had enough trust or I think maybe enough desperation that she made herself known to him. And she cried out and he probably thought she was unhinged and and he just, she just cried out and she made a ruckus and she did not ask politely. She just plain screamed, I need your help for my child now. And the disciples did what we often do. The disciples said, you need to ask more politely. The disciples said, Lord, she's not of the right kind, so let's, let's put her away. The disciples said, well, Jesus, it looks like you're ignoring her too. So since you're ignoring her, then just send her away so she's not going to bother our day anymore. This is one of the hardest scriptures because our very own Jesus that we seem to believe is always on the side of those most damaged, most hurt by the world, most in need. Our very own Jesus says, I've come for Israel. The implication being, I didn't come for you. I'm here to feed the children, not the dogs. The implication being that this woman is a dog. And lest we think that's an insult today, let's just be clear, that was an insult back then. 
maybe in Gentile circles, but probably not in Jewish circles, dogs back then were not household pets that were beloved. They were scavengers, eating scraps at the, at the bottom of the table. That we are familiar with. But she persists. She has enough faith in Jesus, yes, that she persists past his no. And she says, yes, Lord, but even a crumb, even touching the hem of your robe will be enough. Does she have that much faith? Where did it come from? That much trust in Jesus? Or is she just that desperate that she heard rumors about him and she is willing to try anything? Last week, we focused on a psalm of lament, a psalm that's a cry for help. And as we read through it, people said, well, pastor, this psalm sounds more like a trust psalm than a psalm of lament. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, it does. Maybe they go hand in hand. Today, we read this psalm, and this psalm is called a trust psalm. In the first six verses, you hear, Yahweh, you are my light. And let's think about it. When you think of trusting God, what words come to your mind? For the psalmist, it's words like light, salvation. Of whom? Of what shall I be afraid? Confidence. Fortress. Even when my enemies are all around me, even in the midst of COVID, even dealing with systemic racism, even when within my own body there is brokenness and illness, even when my mind seems to be against me, Lord, you are the one that breaks the foes. In you, I have confidence. Another one of those trust words. I will dwell in your house. I will seek you out, Lord, because I believe that your goodness is stronger than my need, that your yes is stronger than your no. I will go to your temple. You are my rock. You will hold me, Lord. You are my tabernacle. In you I find my joy. Trust words. This is a trust psalm, Psalm 27. A psalm that reminds us that this God is a God who is faithful. This God who is God who has been faithful in the past. This is a God who will continue to be faithful in the present. This is a God we can trust in the future. And yet, this psalm sounds like a cry for help. It sounds like a lament psalm because, again, lament crying out for help and trust, they go hand in hand. Verses 7 through 12 say, Hear me, Yahweh, when I cry for you. This is like beating on God's door, saying, Pay attention. This is like this woman at Jesus' feet, saying, yanking on his robe, saying, Hey, don't forget me. You say to my heart, O Lord, seek your face. And so I seek your face. Lord, where are you? Don't hide yourself from me, Lord. Don't turn away from me even if I've done something wrong. Don't reject me, Lord. Don't desert me, Lord. You're the God of my salvation. You're the one that's always been in there in the past. You better be there now. Teach me your way. Lord, guide me. Don't just save me. Put me on my path. Walk with me every step of the way. Our cries for help and our trust go hand in hand. Because it is when those puddle moments, when all seems lost and we don't even know if we can trust our own selves, we don't even know if we can trust the people around us that we reach out. 
We reach out for God and we hang on with our fingernails and we wonder, especially if we have fing flimsy fingernails like me, when will they break? And then we let go. We let go. And we trust that God will catch us. This is a journey of faith. This is a journey of faith. The opposite of faith is not crying out for help. It's not wondering where God is. It's apathy and walking away. One of our greatest, greatest acts of faith is knocking on God's door saying, Come to me, Lord. And the psalmist says, The psalmist says, Even as I wait, I have confidence in you that I will see the goodness of you, Lord Yahweh, in the land of the living. You bring me back into the land of the living. In this life or the next, you will bring me into the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Stand tall and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Beloved children of God, when you are in your puddle moment, what do you do? Do you allow yourself to be in your puddle for a little bit of time? I always call it licking my wounds. I need some time to lick my wounds. Do you reach out to people through whom God works to lift you up and encourage you and remind you that you are not alone? Just like me crawling down to my mom's room and up to her bed. Or a friend of mine who found herself severely depressed in medical school in Israel and all she could do after, after years of kind of learning how her cycles of depression worked, she, uh, she knew that she had to reach out, but she knew she couldn't reach out. Try, try that on for size. What a conundrum. So the most she could do was shoot out an email and said, I need you to contact me. I'm depressed. And so me, who's not always good at long distance communication, and all of our other friends from around the world just leaned in close. And we grabbed hold of her from a distance. And we reached out through emails and note cards and phone calls every way we could. When you're in your puddle moment, who do you reach out to? You see, God provides us with community. Some of us have family we can trust. Some of us have faith community we can trust. Some of us have neighbors that we can, that we can trust. And we know they're not going to be perfect. We have to offer them forgiveness just like they have to offer us forgiveness, especially when we're in our hot mess moments, as I call them. And we have professionals that have been trained to help us. So when you have a physical health problem, do you go reaching out to the doctors? When you have a mental health problem, do you go reaching out to the mental health professionals? If you find that you can't, who do you call to help you make those phone calls even? Beloved child of God, God's got you. And in the midst of this world, that is in chaos and you feel like the world feels like it may be alone and maybe where is this God? We are there for each other to point to what a doctor of mine once called, one of my oncologists once called, tender mercies. How do you point out tender mercies to each other? If you're on Facebook or if you're on the phone, Write to each other, call to each other, say, this is the tender mercy that I have heard. Because the world wants to tell us God's not there. But when we seek the face of God, we see God everywhere. I call it little gifts of grace. So tender mercies works, if you like that one. But I like to think of God's little gifts of grace showering upon ourselves each and every day. Sometimes they're so little that we have to really look for them. So name those gifts of grace. Share them with each other. Reach out. Let us, like Jesus, learn from the Canaanite woman. This woman 
may have been an outsider to Jesus and his disciples. But Jesus was clear, whether he was before or after, regardless of why he did what he did, he was clear after that his mission includes every single person, especially those that the world wants to say are discounted. So let us learn from her to be persistent in our faith, to hold on or to let go and let God hold on to us, to reach out how we can, even if it's tiny, and to seek the face of the Lord in those little gifts of grace showered upon us each and every day. And now, beloved children of God, May the peace of Christ, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in this same Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen.